Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining the Kennedy Institute's Getting to the Point program. I'm Caroline Angel Burke. I am the Vice President for Education, Visitor Experience, and Collections at the Institute. While our building is close to the public, we remain committed to civic engagement and education, and we're glad to welcome you now live, as well as to those of you who log on to enjoy this program later. This afternoon, we are thrilled to welcome David Litt to talk about his new book, Democracy in One Book or Less, how it works, why it doesn't, and why fixing it is easier than you think. Given the volumes and volumes written about the United States Senate alone, some by senators themselves, there's a great allure to diving into a single book that packages complex history, and contemporary issues surrounding our democracy, as David has done. And as I believe he may have a tale or two to share about the Senate itself, both in its founding and in some of its more recent members, I do invite you, invite you to check it out. We at the Kennedy Institute are most excited about hosting this conversation because we're dedicating much of our 2020 programming, digital resources, and online experiences to examining elections, voting, and citizen participation in the democratic process. And this book is a great place to start. Democracy in one book or less traces how our democracy has changed over time, where it went awry, and why there's an urgent need to fix politics before it's too late. Many of you will be familiar with David Litt, not only because of what he has previously written, but because of the person who at one point got to deliver his words. David worked as a member of the White House staff under President Barack Obama from 2011 to 2016, writing remarks for the president on a wide range of domestic policy issues. David also served as the lead writer for four White House Correspondents Dinner Monologues, AKA the State of the Union of Jokes, a fascinating experience that he poured into his 2017 New York Times bestselling memoir, Thanks Obama, My Hopey Changey White House Years. David was head writer for the series Funny or Die DC through 2018 and is currently developing a TV show based on his life in Washington. Moderating the conversation with David today is our great friend Stephanie Murray. Many of you will know Stephanie as the author of Politico Massachusetts Playbook, where she cuts through all the noise to deliver to your inbox every morning the most important stories related to politics and government. We're so grateful to Stephanie for joining us again uh, and being such an asset to the Institute's public programs, both in person and virtually. Stephanie, I'm happy to hand over to you. Thanks. Thank you, Caroline. Um, and it's so good to see you. Uh, I can't believe we're still doing this virtual programming and not in person, but you know, it's just so much fun. So thank you to everyone who's joining us today. And of course, a special thank you to David, uh, who's joining us for what I hope will be a spirited and interesting conversation this afternoon. Um, it goes without saying, but if you haven't uh, gotten this book and read it yet, I really recommend that you do. Uh, it's a really smart read, but it's also a very fun ride that takes you from Mitch McConnell's fraternity house to Schoolhouse Rock to Katy Perry and the NRA and all sorts of fun stuff in between. Uh, and it's about democracy, which is, you know, what well, could be more interesting. So uh, the issues that David explores in this book have only become more pressing amid the coronavirus pandemic and as we see a resurgence of protest and political activism across the country. So, you know, I have so many questions for David. So I will stop talking and kick it over to you. David, my first question is why did you write this book? Um, thank you, Stephanie. And thank you to the Kennedy Institute for having me today. Uh, you know, we, we were talking about this in the green room beforehand, but one of the few silver linings of releasing a book during a pandemic is you get to do all of these virtual events. Um, you know, your, your book tour gets to take on a lot more cities and a lot more places and audiences than you would otherwise get to go. And so I'm so happy that we're getting to do this. And thank you to everyone who's tuned in. Um, and for me, the reason that I wrote this book, it came down to a question, a dilemma that I kept seeing when I worked in the Obama White House. And then it got even more acute during the Trump era on gun violence, on climate change, on health care, on taxes, and now on COVID and on race relations, we keep seeing that the American people want one thing. And generally speaking, the experts actually agree with the people. So the populists and the elitists are in complete agreement. And yet our government doesn't do it. And in many cases, our government does the opposite of what the people want. 
And so when I was a kid, I grew up watching Schoolhouse Rock. I was taught that the people have an idea and it becomes a bill and the bill sings a very catchy song and then it becomes a law. And clearly that's not happening anymore. And that problem is at the heart of everything. If we don't solve it, we can't solve anything else. And so I started to look into this question of why is this actually happening? How can we fix it? And then I wanted to write a book about that question that someone like me would read because there's a limit, you know, if a book is too dense uh, or too heavy, I just tend not to finish it. And um, rather than blame myself for that, I figured I would try to write the book about democracy that I would want to read and, and hopefully plenty of other people will as well. So that's, that's the goal, is that if you read other books after this one or before this one, that's great. But if all you do is read this, you will understand the basics of why our democracy isn't working and how we fix it. And so right at the beginning of the book, you assert something pretty bold, and that's that the way, I mean, the biggest, one of the biggest threats to our democracy is the way that our democratically elected leaders are behaving. I mean, we can go back and forth about whether they're so democratically elected, but why are they behaving that way? What's going on here? I think what we're seeing writ large is that in theory, right, you, you want a country that respects the consent of the governed. And that's always been the goal. Um, you know, when our founders thought about America, they thought about a country that respected the will of the people. Now, they didn't agree on which people ought to count. And that's part of what I talk about in the book. So it's not like we've always been a pure ideal democracy by any means. But this basic idea was, if the people want something, they should be able to get it. And what we've seen during my lifetime, which is not that long at this point, what we've seen is a complete backslide from that. And so now, increasingly, a very small number of people have a lot of power. And if you're one of the people watching this, unless you have a billion dollars or you're Mitch McConnell, in which case, I don't really know why you're watching this, probably have other things to do, but welcome. Um, you know, unless you're one of those people, you don't have that much power. And in fact, you have a lot less power than you used to. So when it seems like our government is not representing us anymore, that's not just a feeling that we all have. That's actually what's happening. And so what, like where, where has it always been? Is the system, I guess my question is, is the system set up for it to be that way? Or are we just so far from what the constitution had laid out so many years ago? Why, why is this happening? Well, I think it's a little bit of both. Our system is not set up to be perfect because there's no such thing. But one of the things that our founders, and, and I should say, I'm not one of the people that thinks that our founders were perfect or any, you know, one of the, the most fun parts of this book was realizing that our founders were just people, right? They squabbled and they bickered and there was roommate drama and all sorts of stuff that shaped our country. But one of the things that our founders recognized was that the structure of government is a direct, leads directly to the outcomes that government produces. Um, John Adams said this, and he said it more eloquently than I will paraphrase it right now, but he basically said the benefits of society depend on the structure of government. And that there's no, the way he said is like, there's no better inquiry for a benevolent mind than to inquire after the best form of government. What I thought was really interesting about that is that he was not saying, so that's why we wrote the constitution or we had the revolution and then you please take what we did and that's it. But he was saying, he was making a statement about the future as well. He was saying, there is nothing more American than sitting down and thinking about how our government should work. But at the same time, because our system of government is always changing, it also means that people who don't particularly care about representing everyone and instead are just trying to seize power for themselves or their friends, they can change our system too. And when you look at American history and especially recent American history, you often see moments when the people who are uh, most effective in changing our system of government are the people least interested in representing all Americans. Before we move on, can you just tell me a little bit about the roommate drama that you're referencing? Um, yeah, so the, the, the great compromise, you might have heard this phrase in history class in school, I certainly did, and it's the, the compromise that said that the House will allocate its members based on population, but in the Senate, every state will get two senators regardless of population size. And the, the great compromise implies that, you know, this was everyone sat down and thought, well, this is a really good idea. Um, you know, this is the best way to move forward. That's totally not true. What happened was 
the small states, or at the time, well, yeah, the small states, led by Gunning Bedford Jr., who was a delegate from Delaware, arrived at the Constitutional Convention and demanded equality of votes. Basically, they demanded that every state get the same number of votes. And James Madison from Virginia, which at the time was the largest state by population, demanded equality of people. In other words, you get more votes if you have more people in your state. And as it happened, James Madison and Gunning Bedford were roommates at Princeton some decades earlier. And so it's not clear when you read the notes of the Constitutional Convention, you know, whether somebody had disrespected the chore chart or failed to leave a sock on the door at the right time. But you have to assume, I think anyone who has had a roommate has to assume that if you arrived for the most important negotiation of your life and it just happened to be with your college roommate, uh, no wonder things were tense. I'll just put it that way. <laughs> Um, and, you know, two of the, I mean, one of the biggest tensions right now is between the two political parties, between Republicans and Democrats. And something that you say in the book is that even if the two-party system survives uh, in the coming decades, there's no guarantee that it's going to represent us in any meaningful way. Um, so, one, what do you mean and how how is that possible? And two, if they don't represent us, then why do we keep them around? So I think if you look at American history, at times, we have had one party democracy in certain parts of the country. Um, if you look at machine politics in, say, the 1960s, um, you know, especially in cities, right, we basically had one party, you had two parties, they had elections, but one party was in charge. Um, if you look at the Jim Crow South, you had a Republican Party in theory, but the segregationist, white supremacist Democrats who were running the South all of the action was in the party primary. There wasn't really a two-party system. I think what is new about this particular moment is that we're seeing an effort to create a one-party democracy nationwide. So Mitch McConnell and a lot of the kind of innovations or the ideas he's using to restrain our democracy and make it less small-d democratic, I think come directly from the tools used by segregationists. Um, Trump, on the other hand, I think behaves exactly like an old school urban machine politician. And what we're seeing now is those two things being combined at the federal level. So I think we will continue to have two parties for the foreseeable future. If we're not careful and if we don't take steps soon, we may see the kind of party that um, Viktor Orban in Hungary refers to as an illiberal democracy. So basically there's elections as long as only one party wins. Um, you know, the people are free to choose what they want as long as they choose what the leaders would like them to choose. And I think that's the danger. Rather than slipping into a completely fascist system or a completely totalitarian system, you slip into something that looks like a democracy on paper, but in fact does not do what a democracy is supposed to do, which is give the people the opportunity to shape their future. So what are like the immediate steps to take to prevent that from happening? Well, there's a few different ones. I think one of the most important things that I tried to get across in the book is that unlike many problems that one might face, you don't have to do things in order when it comes to fixing a democracy. Um, the best way to do it is to try to do everything as quickly as possible and to see what you can accomplish. Um, and there's also no particular moment when someone, you know, the, the ghost of Thomas Jefferson or the, the ghost of Alexander Hamilton comes down and says, by the way, you did it, you saved democracy. That's not how that works. Um, democracy is always in peril and we're always, it's a conservation project. The, the keys, I think, focus on three main areas, and that's how I, I divided up the book. So number one is who gets to vote, making sure that the voters and the people are the same group or as close to the same group as possible, because otherwise politicians will try to win elections by pushing more and more people out of the category of voters. The second thing is making sure that people's votes count equally or as close to equally as possible. So right now, um, you know, I cast my ballot in Washington, D.C. I grew up in New York City. Um, you know, you're, uh, you and I assume a lot of uh, folks who are watching us are voting in Massachusetts. All of our votes count substantially less than the average Americans, and certainly a, a very substantially less than, than a handful of Americans. And there's reasons for that, but that's not, um, it's both unfair and it leads to an imbalance in our government. And then finally, the basic schoolhouse rock process, how does a bill become a law? That has completely changed in the last 40 years so that there are new hurdles to a bill that did not exist when Schoolhouse Rock first came out. And it's one of the reasons why it's much harder for a bill, even when it has popular support, even when the experts are on its side, 
that bill has trouble becoming a law in a way it didn't before. So we do those three things. We make it easier for people to vote. We make people's votes count more equally. And we make it easier for bills that have support to become a law. And that would go a long way toward solving some of these problems we've been talking about. So let's start with the voting. And I'm kind of of two minds about this. So I'm interested to see what you think. But, you know, especially amid the coronavirus pandemic, we've been talking a lot about voting and who gets to vote and how to vote safely. Uh, some states have passed vote by mail laws to make it easier for folks to vote, but we've also seen long lines at polling stations, especially as uh, states have to shut some locations down due to lack of workers or things like that. So do you think that the pandemic is uh, leading to greater voter disenfranchisement or do you think that it's shining a light on something that was already happening? That's a really good question. And one of the scary things is we may not know the answer to that question of whether the pandemic is disenfranchising voters until after the November elections. Um, so I don't fully know. Um, you know, I should say, so I'm going to do, I'm going to, first of all, I'm going to Vanna White the book. So here's, I have, I brought it. Here's the cover. Uh, it's very pretty. It has an American flag. Now that I have displayed the book and, um, you know, now if you, if you love the cover, you should rush and go get it. I will tell you something that I said in the book that was totally wrong. So one of the things that I talk about is I, say, I talk about long lines, the polls, and I say one way to reduce long lines is vote by mail. And some states do it, but probably we were not really going to be talking about it when this book comes out. Uh, I finished writing the book um, in December, January. So it turns out that was a prediction that did not even cl uh, come close to coming true. Um, I think that what we're seeing right now is two different important questions. So one is, Vote by mail, I think, is part of the answer. It's not the entire answer. Um, so we have to figure out how to make sure that everybody who wants to vote can vote. And in general, that turnout isn't suffering because of vote by mail. And it's not just people voting, it's also votes not counting because vote by mail can be more complicated. You know, if you're used to voting in person, um, vote by mail is more complicated and you don't have a poll worker walking you through what you need to do. So I think there was a report in New Jersey recently, 10% of vote by mail ballots were thrown out because there was some error in them. Um, so that, you know, it's not just disenfranchisement of who gets to actually go vote, it's do those votes end up in the total. Then the other question, and this is always important when we're looking at turnout questions of, if there's an impact on voting, is that impact equal for different groups? And I think one of the things that really worries me is the answer is probably not based on what we've seen. We've seen these incredibly long lines and they have affected both white and non-white majority areas but they certainly seem to be affecting cities and minority majority neighborhoods much more. And that's in keeping with what we already know about long lines. In 2012, you were six times more likely to wait for an hour or longer to vote if you were non-white or if you came from, no, that's right, actually, if you were a non-white voter. And so the, the danger is A, that uh, the pandemic is driving down turnout, but B, that the pandemic is exacerbating the issues that already existed where it's harder for some people in America to vote than others, despite us all theoretically having the same democratic rights. And something that, another thing that I found really interesting in this book, and we just had um, a really tight election uh, for the Boston City Council actually last year, where it was decided by just one vote. Um, and a point that you make in the book is that telling everybody to vote because their one vote might be the one that sways the election is like saying that every lottery ticket is going to win or, uh, it's like statistically close to planes crashing. So why should people vote if that's not the reason um, that you know people love to employ? Well, I think that's a really important point because when I was growing up, the what you would often hear is you know every vote makes a difference, and that is technically true. But at the same time, the the benefit of voting from a purely rational economic standpoint, you know, what are my chances that my vote is going to be the deciding vote in an election I care about, they're basically zero. I mean, I, you know, a, a, any one of us, all of us watching could vote and odds are so low that any of us will swing an election in our lifetimes. Although clearly someone did in the Boston City Council recently, so you never know, but it's a pretty safe bet. So when we talk about turnout, we have to talk about voting for other reasons. And one of the things um, when I worked on political campaigns that you see really consistently is that people who vote don't vote because they think they're going to swing an election. They vote because they think the election is fair. They vote because they think their, their vote will matter in some broader sense. And also they vote because it's a habit. It's, it's a sort of 
um, it's a ritual and it's an expression of your civic values. And so I do think it's a mistake if we're trying to increase turnout, and not just for Democrats, even though I'm a Democrat, no matter who's trying to increase turnout, to say everyone should vote because any vote might be the difference maker is not really compelling. But to say everyone should vote because this is your chance to make a difference in the future of your democracy, in the future of your country, and that's a chance that has been denied to most people throughout human history, that I think it's a little bit more airy, but at the same time, it's also more accurate. So I think that's, that's particularly important. Um, and the last thing I'll say about that is, it also means we really need to bring down the barriers to voting. Because the benefits are, again, from a purely rational standpoint, not that high for each individual to vote. So it doesn't take much to convince some people not to vote. Um, you know, if you had to wait for two hours to vote, and in exchange, you have essentially a 0% chance of swinging an election, it's not surprising to me, and I wouldn't blame people who choose to leave that line. What I would blame, you know, the people I would blame are the people who are creating that two hour line and making it hard for people to cast that ballot. And do you have concerns about November um, and the 2020 presidential election? I mean, vote by mail, a lot of states are trying out new systems, elections officials are worried they won't be able to count the ballots uh, that night. Uh, we might not know who the president is for days or even a week. So I, first of all, I'm absolutely worried. And I also think none of what I'm saying should indicate that I don't think it's important to vote in November, to volunteer, to do what, you know, to work the polls, whatever it is that you do uh, in order to help make our democracy function. It's more important than ever to do that precisely because of these worries. And, and that's something I really tried to get at is, you know, I, I'm, this is not a how democracies die book. And it's not how I think about it. It's more of, you know, once you have a diagnosis, how democracies survive. And I think when we think specifically about November, there's a couple of things that really do worry me. I mean, first of all, mail-in voting systems are not going to be applied equally and, and similarly everywhere. Um, we don't really have a national election in America. We have 50 state elections plus DC. And in some ways that's good because it makes our elections a lot harder for a foreign country to hack, just to use one example. But it also means that some states are not going to do as good a job as others. And some states are going to intentionally do a bad job. I think that's important to note. Um, long lines, which are a symptom of every problem. The reason I keep coming back to it is that almost any problem with voting leads to long lines. They happen in red states and blue states. But what we've recently seen in red states is intentional mismanagement of elections in order to create long lines that make it hard for people to vote. I think we will see that in, uh, in November. I think we will definitely see a lot of states reporting late. And I think one of the most uh, important things that all of us can do, whether you're you know, somebody who just is talking to your friends or you're on social media or you're in the press or you just wrote a book or whatever, is to make it clear that just because an election, the, the returns are not in until after election day does not mean something fishy happened. Um, we should expect that in this case. That's certainly how a lot of states already do their counting. So California does it that way, Arizona does it that way. And one of the things we've seen is attempts by President Trump and by some of his allies in both his administration and also in Congress to discredit elections where the counting continues after the day of the election. But there's no reason for that. There's no basis for what they're saying. And I think it's really important so that we have trust in the system that we make that clear before rather than after the fact. I mean, we're seeing this literally right now in Kentucky, they're finishing up a count for an election that occurred last Tuesday. And it doesn't mean that the winner didn't win. It just means that the votes were meant in many cases postmarked on election day rather than prior to that. You know, we're going to have to become more patient and get used to waiting a little bit more, yeah. uh, which is a change, but um, it'll be interesting to see. And before we move on from voting, we actually have a question um, from one of the viewers who's joining us uh, this afternoon. And that is, what are your thoughts on ranked choice voting? We have um, kind of a push here to get a ranked choice voting ballot question on the ballot in Massachusetts this fall. Um, so I'd be interested to hear your thoughts on that. The short answer is I think ranked choice voting is great. Um, let me just quickly exp explain ranked choice voting for people watching who don't know what it is. Um, ranked choice voting, I explain it more in the book. I do a whole hypothetical election where I pit my uh, wife against my cats and my now deceased goldfish um, in a hypothetical ranked choice election. And uh, I won't tell you who wins, but I'll say it wasn't my wife. Um, 
the, the way that ranked choice voting essentially works is rather than voting for just one candidate, you list your candidates in order of preference. So if there's three candidates, you list all three, first, second, third. And if your first choice candidate comes in last, your second choice gets to count instead of your first choice. The, the important thing to know with ranked choice voting, as opposed to getting bogged down in the details, is that it's a way of ensuring that your vote counts toward the final election between the two top people, whether or not you pick one of those two people from the beginning. So in other words, you can vote your heart without worrying about throwing away your vote. I think that's really promising. They do it in Maine. People seem to really like it. New York City just passed a ballot initiative that's going to move local elections to ranked choice voting. It's an especially big deal in states where, and cities particularly, where let's say in, in Boston, right? Um, in a mayoral election, the Republican is probably not going to win that election. So the real question is going to be on the Democratic side. And by having ranked choice voting, you can have more choices available to voters so that even in a, in a deep blue or deep red part of the country, your vote still matters in terms of figuring out who wins. And the final thing I'll say about ranked choice voting, and maybe my favorite reason for it, is I think it's also a way to drive up turnout. Because particularly young voters, want to vote for their first choice. Um, I think a lot of voters think of voting as an expression of their values. And so rather than ask people to go into the voting booth and hold their nose, which I think tends to be what a lot of us ask voters to do, we could ask voters to say, go into the voting booth, pick your favorite candidate, and they may win because they have your support. But even if they don't, you then can also pick some other candidates and your voice will still matter. And I think what we've seen, you know, I talked to a candidate in Maine who got about 5% of the vote in a ranked choice election, but she said, there were people who came and voted for me and they wouldn't have voted otherwise. And because of that, their votes ended up counting toward the winner's total as well. So one more question about kind of the political and voting process before you move on to uh, the House and Senate and the legislative process. And this is another question that comes from a viewer uh, who's with us this afternoon. And the question is, should and can political parties restrict who can run in their primaries and participate in their debates, uh, for example, should they require a primary candidate have been a member of the party for a certain number of years and to disclose uh, their taxes to be eligible to run in a primary? Um, and the, the viewer points out that these issues would have impacted Vermont Senator Bernie Sanders, who of course uh, ran for the Democratic nomination and uh, President Donald Trump. I think that's a really difficult question because party primaries are separate than you know, national elections are about our democracy functioning. Party primaries are, in a strange way, not that different than if, you know, you had like um, a, a parent-teacher conference or a local club. They're, they're private organizations running things the way they see fit. So I think as a matter of principle, it's not as, the stakes are not quite as high. Um, this is also a way of saying I haven't fully thought this through um, because I don't really address it in the book. The, the thing I will generally say is, if I were sitting down and trying to figure out the answer to that question, I think you have to balance two different concerns. Because one of them is the party does have an interest in nominating the person it thinks is going to win a general election, and also it thinks best represents the party. At the same time, I think because primary elections have become so important, even though it's not required, encouraging high turnout, encouraging um, independent voters who might then vote for that candidate in the general, those things are all very valuable. So I think it's a, it's a difficult juggling act. Um, but I do, I generally think, um, you know, if you had to pick open primaries are probably a better idea in most cases because they're bringing in independent voters who will then vote in the general election. So that seems like a win. And the other thing I would say is the thing to definitely not do is discourage voting from members of that party. So Utah, for example, has a system where if you win at a statewide convention, if you win by enough of the delegates, there's about 2,000 delegates, you skip a primary election entirely. Well, that's basically saying, we don't care about our voters, we want our sort of, uh, you know, our elites to pick a nominee. Um, similarly, New York, uh, for a long time, and, and this was true, I think it was in 2016, they scheduled two different primaries, or maybe it's 2018, two different primaries in two different parts of the summer, and I think that was a pretty clear attempt to drive down turnout. And again, I don't think you should want low turnout from your own voters. So high turnout, I think, you know, as a general principle, high turnout elections are better elections. 
So let's talk about the House and the Senate. And if we were doing this, uh, if we were talking in person at the Kennedy Institute, we would actually be sitting in a model of the Senate, which is one of my favorite parts about being there. It's a pretty cool experience. But uh, so the House, of course, I think, as we all know, is supposed to be a mini model of the country that kind of reflects what's going on in the United States. And then the Senate is supposed to be kind of the body that cools things down. It's often referred to as a saucer. Um, and I'll let you explain uh, how that works. Um, but my question is, has have the two chambers succeeded in that goal? And has it changed uh, during the pandemic and the pandemic response in Washington? So, well, first of all, let me say, I mean, you know, if the choice was the, the Senate chamber or uh, my office where you can't see it, but there's, there's a litter box in one corner. I mean, how, you know, <laughs> per, I don't know. I'm just saying it's a, it's a tough call. Um, when it comes to the Senate and the House, the story you're talking about, this idea, so in theory, the, the story is that Thomas Jefferson and George Washington were sitting down and um, I think it was Je Jefferson said, why do we have a Senate? You know, we have a house, why do we have a Senate? And George Washington said, well, why do you uh, pour your coffee from, a, from the um, coffee cup into a saucer before you drink it? And Jefferson said, well, to cool it. And Washington said, for the same reason, we pour legislation from the, into the senatorial saucer to cool it. Now, first of all, the most important thing to know about this story is one, it did not happen. Um, almost certainly this, this breakfast never occurred. Second important thing, is that actually they were talking about literal saucers, like little mini plates. Um, they, they would pour liquid, hot liquid into these little plates and then like lap them up. Um, and so that was our founders, um, which is really weird. So that was the thing I discovered. It also explains why, by the way, when you go to a banquet, they still put saucers underneath coffee cups. It has nothing to do with democracy, but was a really, I, I didn't know that I wanted to know the answer to this question until I started researching the House and the Senate. So in theory, the House should be a mirror of the people. It should be the place where sort of our passions are let loose. You know, uh, it shouldn't necessarily be better than us. The House should be just like us. And the Senate should be better than us. It should be wiser. Um, one senator who I talk about in the book referred to the Senate as the sober second thought of the people. So, you know, when you've had too many beers, the Senate is the, is the voice in your head that says, like, don't hit send on that email. That's the Senate. And I think both chambers have veered from that original idealized view. Um, the House less so, but the House now reflects parties rather than the American people as a whole. So the House is now a reflection of the party in charge. And there's a variety of reasons for that that I go into the book, um, including some great stories about literally uh, congressmen trying to flee the House chamber and being, you know, tracked down and like pinned against a locked door so that they had to take votes. Um, the Senate, I think, has gone from being a kind of cooling saucer to being a complete deep freeze. And the biggest reason for that especially in recent history, was Mitch McConnell's decision to change the nature of the filibuster, which at one point was used rather sparingly. So you needed 60 votes to pass legislation, but most people, most senators did not use the filibuster every time. Starting in 2008, the filibuster essentially changed because it went from being an occasional requirement to being an almost universal requirement. And because of that, it's very hard to get 60 votes in the Senate for anything. And what we've seen is legislation doesn't go there to sort of be cooled by you know, or a sober second thought. Um, legislation goes to the Senate to die. And that is, I think, a particularly, uh, you know, there's all sorts of problems with the House, but what's happening in the Senate is particularly dangerous to democracy. And so is there a way that the Senate could be reformed to get to a place where it's more active again, or for a place to be a place where Democrats can get more through even when it's held by Republicans, or is the only solution for Democrats to flip the Senate if they want uh, more control in Washington? Well, I think Democrats do have to flip the Senate. One of the things that then Democrats, I believe, should do once they flip the Senate is eliminate the legislative filibuster. Um, rather, when I went into writing this book, I thought the best way to approach the filibuster is going to be to reform it somehow. Uh, and that's what we've done throughout American history. We've changed it, we've tweaked it, so I was thinking it takes 60 votes to pass a law now, maybe it should take 55 or 53, or we should make senators you know, stand there like Mr. Smith goes to Washington and give a big speech. And I talked to a bunch of experts, including um, uh, someone named Murray Paoni, who ran procedure. He was like the democratic procedure guru in the Senate for decades. And he 
ended up telling me, along with a lot of other people who are real institutionalists, that it seems like the time has come. That it doesn't mean there won't be unintended consequences to getting rid of the filibuster, but that the alternative, which is the Senate, a Senate that can't vote on legislation, is worse than what we could get if we got rid of the legislative filibuster. So I think that's important. And the other thing that I think is very important when it comes to the Senate is that because the Senate favors small population states and therefore favors rural states, you end up with a dynamic where America's senators are more conservative than American people. And one way to start to balance that out would be to admit DC as a state, which the House voted to do last week, and to admit Puerto Rico as a state, which has also come up um, a lot more frequently in recent years, that wouldn't undo the Republican built-in advantage in the Senate, but it would ameliorate it a little bit, and I think it's worth doing as well. So what's the holdup on DC statehood and making Puerto Rico a state? Uh, we've talked about it for years. Why, why hasn't it happened? The holdup on DC statehood is really simple. Um, if DC were a state, it would almost certainly send Democrats to the Senate. And statehood has always been a political question. I mean, one of, one of the stories that I enjoyed from the book writing about was that we had one Dakota territory. And one of the reasons we now have a North and a South Dakota is that the Republican senators and, and congressmen who were in charge in the 1890s, they wanted four senators to come from this reliably Republican territory rather than just two. And so this is not new. Um, what I think is particularly notable about DC statehood is that if DC entered the union, it would be the second majority non-white state. Um, until recently, DC would have been a majority black state, um, and now it's, it would still be a majority non-white. And you know, the way I put it, I've lived in DC for more than a decade. If everyone who lived in DC looked like me, DC would have become a state a long time ago. But because DC is a majority non-white state, and because it's so deep blue, um, you see people coming up with all sorts of, I'm just going to say, very interesting arguments to oppose it. I mean, you saw Tom Cotton last week say, well, you know, Wyoming is home to miners and loggers and ranchers, and D.C. is home to white-collar professionals, so therefore the miners and, and ranchers should, you know, should count. Um, that doesn't, I don't really remember that in the Constitution, right? this idea that, like, you know, only a certain type of profession counts. Um, you know, if you were casting for a Discovery Channel show, I would rather watch a Discovery Channel show about miners or ranchers than about me. But, uh, but when it comes to who should vote, like, I don't think that should make a difference. And I think the weakness of these arguments is, is betraying what's really at stake, which is this is a political question. And, and what about Puerto Rico? So Puerto Rico is a slightly different case for two reasons. One is um, in DC, we pay federal taxes. So unlike uh, people who live in territories, people in DC pay the taxes you would pay if you lived in a state. In fact, DC pays more in taxes than 22 other states, despite the fact that we have pretty few people living here. So that's one thing that sets DC apart. And then the other thing is when I was growing up and you know, sort of first learned about Puerto Rico, I was always taught that the Puerto Rican people did not want to be a state. And that started to change. It's not 100% clear cut, but I think the trend has clearly been in the direction of statehood. And so I think, um, you know, ultimately, the future of Puerto Rico, I think, ought to be up to the Puerto Rican people. Um, that said, I, w I hope that what the Puerto Rican people decide is that they want to join the union as a state, um, both for reasons involving the Senate, but also because I think statehood, you know, we saw this in D.C. when the military essentially occupied our city for a week not too long ago. Um, I think a lot of people in Puerto Rico saw this in the disastrous response to Hurricane Maria. Uh, being a state gives you benefits. It means you matter to your leaders in a way that you don't if you're not a state. Uh, sometimes even in COVID projections, people will leave DC off, which I think is, you know, I mean, as someone who lives here, I just find completely flabbergasting. But if we were a state, I, we would not be left off that list. So what you mentioned earlier about um, drawing a line uh, in the Dakota Territory to make it two different states makes me, it made me think about redistricting. And you make this important and interesting point in the book that redistricting doesn't just um, impact who wins an election, but it also kind of impacts how laws get passed or how they don't. Um, so what, what are the things about redistricting that kind of we don't talk about as much as just who wins elections? So the, the two key things I think you need to know about redistricting, and the first I think will surprise a lot of liberals and progressives, and the second will not. Um, the first is that 
one of the main reasons we have so few competitive districts in this country. I mean, your odds of living in a, in a competitive congressional district have fallen by more than half since the 1990s. So one of the reasons for that has nothing to do with gerrymandering um, or, or drawing unfair district lines. It's that Democrats are increasingly the party of cities and are packed into cities, and Republicans are increasingly the party of outside of cities. And so, for example, I grew up on the Upper West Side of Manhattan. You, even if you tried to draw a really competitive district, you couldn't do it. You could not find 730,000 people living around the apartment where I grew up and not have those people be overwhelmingly Democratic voters. Um, and you're seeing that around the country. Then on top of that, you have more aggressive gerrymandering than you've ever seen in the history of the United States at a nationwide level. And that's because in 2010, Republicans had a huge win in the midterms. They won all of these state legislatures and governorships, and they used that power to redraw districts because districts are redrawn every 10 years. And so when the University of Chicago looked at this, what they found was that redistrict, uh, gerrymandering rather, affected Congress in small but real ways in the 1980s, the 1990s, the 2000s. But then in 2010, it was a totally different degree where suddenly they found that um, on average, Republicans are benefiting by one member per state from gerrymandering. And that's, um, putting it a little differently, none of us have uh, until 2010 experienced this phenomenon where maps determine who represents us far more than people do. And, and that's part of what we're seeing in terms of the policy outcomes you get. That's so interesting. So we've got voting, we've got the House and Senate, and then we have the judiciary. And you make an interesting point that, you know, even after, if Democrats were able to flip the House, uh, flip the Senate, excuse me, um, and this is something that came up so often in the presidential primary and the debates that was always talking about Mitch McConnell and flipping the Senate, but even if that happens, there will be something else standing in the way of Democrats um, if they do flip the Senate and that's the judiciary. Um, and so I was hoping you could elaborate on that um, and talk about whether this is a partisan problem or if it's a, if it's a structural problem uh, that would impact either party. So I think there's two things where if you, if you just know these two things about American politics, everything else makes a lot more sense. Um, one of them we've already talked about. States are more conservative than people. There's 30 red states, at least as of the last presidential election, even in an election where the majority of people voted for the Democrats. The second thing that's really important to know is that on nearly every major issue, the Republican Party is currently not taking the majority view. And I don't just say that as a Democrat, you can look at this in terms of the polling. Uh, you know, we, we've gone through some of them, climate change, taxes, gun violence, whether you should wear a mask in public. Um, all of these are moments when the Republican agenda is not one that has a lot of popular support. So if you're Mitch McConnell, your long-term goal is to figure out how to pass an agenda through it in a democratic process without being accountable to voters. And that makes judges incredibly attractive because judges, unlike the members of the other two branches of government, can't be elected. Um, and I don't think we should have to elect judges, or we should elect judges, by the way, but that's a feature of judges, that they, they can't be elected, they can't be recalled by the voters, and they serve for life. So, you know, for example, um, Justin Walker, who's a Mitch McConnell protege who was just elevated to the DC circuit, or, um, you know, he's 37. He will be on that court most likely for 40 years. And he will have views that most Americans don't agree with, but they're going to become law essentially anyway. So it, we are going to face that as, as Democrats, but also as a country where what the people want will matter less and less because the judges have overwhelmingly been appointed by Reagan, both Presidents Bush and now President Trump. And the nominating process that those four presidents have used is completely different than the nominating process that came before them, both from Republicans and the current nominating process used by Democrats. And it's much more political. It's much more about finding judges who agree with the goals of your political party, as opposed to finding judges who have a broad judicial philosophy that you agree with. And so the, the judiciary has become a wing of the conservative movement. And I think that's, that's just a fact. And what we are going to do with that information, I think is an important question. So how do you square that with some of the, the decisions coming out of the Supreme Court over the last couple of weeks, uh, which liberals have been celebrating as wins? Um, how do those two ideas uh, kind of play with each other? I think it's a really interesting point because just the, the, the mere fact that you have a conservative court, and here we're just talking about the Supreme Court, is 
not enough to mean that every single decision comes down according to what the conservatives would theoretically want. However, if you look at the three decisions that liberals have celebrated, first of all, these are all good decisions in that they've made America better and they're, they're protecting people who need protection. So I'm not unhappy that the court delivered them. But if you look at LGBTQ rights in the workplace, this was a, an idea that was so popular, this idea that you should not be allowed to fire someone for their sexual orientation. Um, it, it was so popular, I think 45% of Americans already thought it was a law. In 2013, it had overwhelming popular support. Um, DACA and the, Dream, and, and the DREAM Act similarly had enormous popular support. So unlike the decisions liberals have celebrated in the past, like Brown v. Board of Education, where these things were unpopular and the court was stepping in to protect the rights of minorities against it, uh, the tyranny of the majority. In this case, the court was stepping in and saying, okay, the overwhelming majority of Americans can have a little bit of what they want some of the time, which is much less inspiring. And I also think it's very important to note, if you look at those decisions, and here I kind of got into like constitutional law, and I will say constitutional law is like so muddy and dense, and it's one of the, the reasons it's very hard for non-lawyers, I'm not a lawyer, and you know, people who like to speak in English as opposed to legalese to understand it. But if you look at these three decisions, I'm gonna to try to do a very quick version. Um, the, the first, Neil Gorsuch wrote this decision. He didn't say LG, LGBTQ people have rights. What he said was, I'm a textualist, which is basically a super conservative legal philosophy, and I'm going to reach a liberal conclusion this one time, but I'm going to do it in a way that then gives me cover to reach an extremely conservative conclusion many, many, many more times in the future. Um, Roberts with DACA essentially said to the Trump administration, you have to do a little bit of homework to pretend that you're not trying to discriminate and that you have some good reason for doing what you're doing, uh, so try again later. Um, he didn't fully protect dreamers. And then in this most recent decision um, around abortion laws, he said, well, the issue is not that women have a right to choose, the issue is precedent. So in 2016, we issued one decision, we can't be so quick to reverse it. Again, that's sort of delaying rather than, you know, it's, it's not a victory, it's sort of saying we'll delay a defeat. All good decisions, but all reached in a way that ultimately will benefit conservatives. So when you look at all of that, what you're seeing is kind of liberals being thrown a bone occasionally um, while the court lurches to the right. And I think um, the good news I, from, from my perspective is that a lot of progressives and liberals are not falling for it. So you're kind of acting as a, as a saucer there, like our friends in the Senate, kind of cooling the, the excitement among progressives and liberals. Um, I am sorry to say that we're actually getting close to our, our time this afternoon. So I just wanted to send it back to you one more time to give any closing remarks or highlight anything that I might have missed. Um, the only thing that, you know, I, I mean, I guess, you know, there's, there's plenty of stuff we didn't get to talk about, which is too bad, of course, but when you, when you try to write a book about all of politics, I feel like an hour is probably, I sort of thought this might happen. Um, what I will say, uh, the, the one thing I'd want to um, leave you with, if you've been watching uh, for the last hour, is an idea um, that I call the Skywalker window. And that idea is, is that change, when it comes, is not necessarily going to look like this very complicated long-term process. Uh, where there's lots of deliberation, it may look like the end of episode four of Star Wars, where Luke Skywalker is headed toward the Death Star, and it looks impenetrable, but there's this tiny opening, and if you make your shot in the, the one moment you get, everything changes really fast. So if you've been listening to all of the things we've been talking about, and feeling like, well, this is a little depressing, um, it actually turns out with the right window, and, and that would certainly include if Biden becomes president and the Democrats retake the House and the Senate, which is possible, though not certain, um, you can undo, I would say, 80 or 90 percent of what Mitch McConnell has done since he was elected to the Senate in 1984. You could undo it in six months if you have the political will. And so I think there's no question that we're in serious trouble as a country, but there's also no question that we still have the ability to fix our political process using our political process. And the words that President Obama spoke that first made me want to get involved in politics, he was looking out at the crowd after he won the Iowa caucuses, and he said, people, uh, he said, faced with impossible odds, people who love this country can change it. And that, I think, is, is a perfect summation of the promise of any democracy. And that promise is under threat, but it's absolutely still alive. 
and it's something that I think, you know, if we work together, we, we, there's no question in my mind, we can preserve, um, you know, the way I think about the book ultimately is uh, we can shatter Mitch McConnell's dreams within Mitch McConnell's lifetime. And I think that's absolutely an achievable goal. Well, David, thank you so much for being so generous with your time this afternoon. And thanks to everyone who's tuned in along with us. Um, and Caroline, I can turn it back to you now uh, for some closing remarks. A huge thank you to David and to Stephanie for this really important conversation today. Um, and to you, our audience members who have joined us. For those of you that didn't catch it in the chat box, we did include a link to um, David's book if you'd like to get a copy of that. Um, and a recording of this program will be available on the Kennedy Institute's website tomorrow. So you can review that and, and send it to your friends. The other Jedis of democracy, I love that. <laughs> Stay tuned for updates from the Institute on for future, future virtual programs and on our upcoming digital exhibit, all about how each of us has a critical role um, to play in the elections this fall. The first two steps, of course, to engage is to make sure you're registered to vote. And if you haven't done so already, there's still time to fill out your census form online at 2020census.gov. Thank you again to all of you for your continued support and dedication to democracy and civic engagement. On behalf of the Kennedy Institute, we'll see you next time.